जन पाया हरे योगेन्द्र वंदन श्रीनंदन जन हरे योगेन्द्र वंदन जन पाया हे Yeah. 
Text number three. Dhruva Maharaj's younger brother Uttama, who was still unmarried, once went on a hunting excursion and was killed by a powerful yaksha in the Himalayan mountains. Along with him, his mother, Suruchi, also followed the path of her son. She died. Text number four. When Dhruva Maharaj heard of the killing of his brother Uttama by the Yakshas in the Himalayan mountains, being overwhelmed with lamentation and anger, he got on his chariot and went out for victory over the city of the Yakshas, Alakapuri. Purport. Dhruva Maharaj is be becoming angry, <coughs> overwhelmed with grief, and envious of the enemies, was not compatible with his position as a great devotee. It is a mis is oh, is is not in is not incompatible with his position as a great devotee. It is a misunderstanding that a devotee should not be angry, envious, or overwhelmed by lamentation. Dhruva, Dhruva Maharaj was the king, and when his when his brother was unceremoniously killed, it was his duty to take revenge against the Yakshas from the Himalayas. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chatsur Nilindandya Shri Gurave Namaha 
Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kathata Shri Vasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Srila Prabhupada points out there's nothing wrong in a devotee becoming angry or even being envious or lamenting. These feelings may arise in the devotee, but uh, it's not incompatible with his position as a devotee. So here we see Dhruva Maharaj we heard how Dhruva Maharaj had gone to the forest and performed great austerities and within a period of six months the Supreme Lord appeared to him in the forest there uh, Madhuvan and then Dhruva Maharaj comes back and he's recognized as a great devotee such a great devotee and now we're hearing how it becomes angry. So people sometimes think, oh, this is not good. A devotee, someone who's a devotee, they should not become angry. But sometimes we would see Srila Prabhupada angry. Huh? Certainly. <laughs> when we knew Prabhupada was angry, we'd be careful, we'd keep away. <laughs> We want to keep away, don't get too close, don't get near Prabhupada because he's angry today, he's upset. Sometimes Prabhupada would be angry with us that we didn't do things properly. We didn't do things right. I remember one time I was in England and we were worshipping the deities and we had done some, what had happened, we were rushing to get the altar opened. And somehow when the altar opened, the Guru Parampara pictures were in the wrong order. <laughs> so Prabhupada noticed and complained, what is this? He was angry. Another time, we, were, we, we had Radha Landanishwara on the bottom and we had Jagannath up on top. Jagannath Baladeva and Subhadra, the deities, were up on top, above Radha and Krishna deities. So when they opened the curtain, we had nice decorations around La Radha Landanishwara, but we hadn't put any flowers on the top because we were rushing to get the curtain open in time. Prabhupada wanted everything punctual. If you were not on time, that was also not pleasing to Prabhupada. You had to be on time. So we were rushing and we, we hadn't put the bases up on top around Jagannath. And when we opened the curtain, there was not, there was only the Jagannath deities, there were no decorations. But round Radha, Radha Landanishwara, there was quite a bit of decoration. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada picked up on that and said, why like this? Why is there nothing up here? Why so much here and nothing there? Like that, he was upset. Another time in Los Angeles, Prabhupada was taking Charanamrita. Someone had put salt in the charanamrita instead of sugar. And Prabhupada took the charanamrita and tasted it. He said, this is, who's put salt? Who's done this? And there was some young girl. What did you do, Prabhupada? You know. And Prabhupada just turned to the managers and said, get somebody responsible to do this in the future. So like that, you know. I mean, Prabhupada yeah, could get angry. He could, but he was using his anger in the service of Krishna. He never became controlled by the anger. That's the difference. You know, we talk about anger 
that we can use it in the service of Krishna. But if one is not the con if one is not in control of his mind and senses, then we shouldn't try to use anger. Because without being in control of our mind and senses, we become controlled by the anger. And being controlled by the anger, then we degrade ourselves and we fall into the darker modes of ignorance. And that is, of course, described in the Bhagavad Gita. It's described that there are three gates to hell, lust, anger, and greed, and every sin man should avoid these things. And it's also mentioned uh, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, different stages of fall down, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. Then from such attachment, lust develops. And then from lust, anger arises. Then from anger comes delusion, bewilderment of memory, intelligence is lost, and a person falls down again into the material pool. So this all comes about. Anger is described as the younger brother of lust. Because our lust is not satisfied, we become angry. So that kind of anger is certainly to be avoided and to be given up. But here, in this particular case, Dhruva Maharaj is justified to become angry. Because, first of all, it's his duty as a Kshatriya, as a ruler, he has to give protection. The Kshatriyas are meant to protect the citizens. And here you see uh, Dhruva Maharaj's brother had gone into the forest on some expedition and he was killed by some Yaksha. So if anybody goes into the forest, they are also at the risk of being killed by some Yakshas. So there's a danger for the citizens. So Dhruva Maharaj was considering that my brother is being killed. It could happen again and again. So he understood that as the ruler, it was his duty to take some action against that uh, violence which had been used against his own brother. Dhruva Maharaj wants to give protection to his citizens that there should not be the fear of the Yakshas. So therefore Dhruva Maharaj became angry at them and he went off to fight with them. Of course, to fight you have to be in an angry mood. You cannot go out into battle and just be calm and, <laughs> and just uh, be peaceful. You have to be pretty much, uh, you have to be very influenced, there has to be some influence of the Rajagun there. The Kshatriyas are expected to be in that mode of passion. Instead of going out into battle, they cannot just simply be Brahmins and in the mode of goodness. Of course, this was one of Arjuna's problems. When Arjuna was discussing with Lord Krishna about reasons why he didn't want to fight, uh, he, he was, Arjuna was considering that it's, it's not proper, that this is not good, I'm going to get sinful reactions, and I'm going to, I'm not going to enjoy, and I should, oh, he was arguing, I should be compassionate. But Lord Krishna points out, well, your compassion, what you are being compassionate for, is not worthy of grief. Because those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. And so Krishna, taking the position of the teacher of Arjuna, he immediately began to chastise Arjuna and telling him that, oh, you're speaking such learned words, but you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. 
Arjuna was thinking, oh, we should be compassionate, we shouldn't kill. But Lord Krishna said, well, it's your duty as a Kshatriya. You're challenged to fight, you have to fight. And if you don't fight, then people will not, the people are not going to praise you. Arjuna was thinking, maybe, maybe Arjuna was thinking that if he didn't fight, people will think, oh, I am very great. I didn't fight, I refused to fight. But Lord Krishna said, they're not going to praise you. They will condemn you. They will say the reason why you didn't fight was because you were cowardly. And that is dishonor. And to be dishonored is worse than death for the Shantra. For one who has been honored previously, to then be dishonored is worse than death. So in this way, Lord Krishna was pointing out to Arjuna that don't try and be a Brahmana. That's not your position. You're not a Brahman, you're a Kshatriya. Of course, he's a devotee, but at the same time, he is in the role as a Kshatriya. And the Kshatriya is meant to be heroic and bold and courageous and go into battle and fight. Arjuna is pleading, oh, I should be compassionate. So in the same way, people sometimes think, Sadhu should not get angry. So one time Prabhupada had a Pandal program in Delhi and uh, there was a young Western hippie, some person with long hair, dirty clothes and so on. And he, he tried to ask Srila Prabhupada some question. And so then Prabhupada turned to him and Prabhupada asked him questions. And then the hippie started to get angry and said, no, I asked you question, you answer my question. And Prabhupada said, I am not your servant. He said, you, ask, you answer my question. And like this, there was some argument that it got quite heated. And uh, so all of this took place on the stage in a big pandal in Delhi. And people were watching and some people were upset. They thought, oh, Swamiji should not get angry. But the devotees pointed out to these people that see, Prabhupada getting angry, he was make, pointing out that you want to get knowledge from the spiritual teacher, you have to be submissive. You have to accept their authority. You have to be willing to hear from them. You cannot be challenging them. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita 434, the famous verse in Bhagavad Gita, just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. So in the purport there, Srila Prabhupada describes it, when a person inquires from a spiritual teacher, you should not put questions in a challenging manner. If you put questions in a challenging manner, then the spiritual teacher is not going to be inclined to answer. There's no purpose in answering questions put in a challenging mode. Just like sometimes people ask stupid questions like, can God make a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? You know, this kind of stupid question like this, you see? So people ask these silly questions sometimes. The one devotee, he, he came up with a good answer to this question. He said, yes, he said, you are that stone. Because you ask such a stupid question. Your intelligence is so dumb, it's like a stone. That even God cannot pick you up. And so like that, uh, Challenging questions, they should be avoided. The, the, it's not the business of the teacher to respond to challenging questions.
So approaching the spiritual uh, approaching the spiritual teacher there's a certain etiquette required. They should not be absurd questions and they should not be challenging questions. So sometimes the spiritual teacher will get angry and sometimes he will display that anger in the service of Krishna to correct the mentality of the person who is, or, or maybe, maybe the disciples, maybe the students, so that anger can be used to give us proper direction, proper instruction. Just sometimes Lord Krishna would also get angry. Lord Krishna in fighting different demons, sometimes he will get a bit angry at them. Lord Krishna also has feelings. He is a person. And if the different demons come and they offer, if they, they're very insulting sometimes to Krishna, they will speak nasty words to Krishna and they will demand that Krishna surrender to them. So Krishna gets angry, a little angry at them, just to retaliate for their ignorance, for their stupidity. So that anger is not wrong. You cannot criticize people for that. If they're using the anger to give good instruction. But at the same time, the devotee has to be very careful not to become controlled by the anger, but to use it carefully, not to be overwhelmed by the anger to the extent that you become degraded. Just like sometimes people get angry and they're angry for three days, you know, that's not proper use of anger. So like Prabhupada would get angry, but then the next minute he would say, do something about it. He wouldn't keep the angry mood. Very quickly he would give up that anger and come to the, again, on his transcendental platform. Actually, we could say that his anger was also transcendental anger because it was used in the service of Krishna. Just the other day, I was reading from the Brihad Bhagavad Amrita, and it was describing how uh, Padmavati, Padmavati is Kamsa's mother. Padmavati and uh, Satyabhama, Krishna's, one of Krishna's principal wives, that they both became lusty after Krishna. When they saw Krishna, they were so attracted by the beauty of Krishna that they became lusty after Krishna. And so they were running after Krishna with their arms out like this, you know, to, to Krishna. They wanted to embrace Krishna. So people will think, oh, lust, is that wrong? Are they supposed to be Satyabhama and Padmavati and they're in Krishna Leela? Are they supposed to be lusty like this? Is this proper? Well, their lust is in relation to Krishna. Just as the gopis, they're also lusty for Krishna. But there are different levels of lust. Just like Kubja is lusty for Krishna. But Kubja's, Kubja means the hunchback lady who was a uh, bringing sandalwood for Kamsa and she met Lord Krishna. So Kupja was a young woman but she had a twisted back which Lord Krishna straightened for her. Of course when Kupja saw Krishna she was overwhelmed with lust. That Krishna was so attractive she immediately thought that she could enjoy with Krishna and she wanted to enjoy with Krishna. So that was, that lust was there. 
And we will see that kind sometimes in these dealings between Krishna's devotees and Lord Krishna, there is a lust. But that lust, because it's in relation to Krishna, that is, you could say, it's transcendental lust. It's not like the lust of the material world, because it's in relation to Krishna. Just as the gopis, they have lust for Krishna. But their lust for Krishna is for the pleasure of Krishna. It's not just simply for their own pleasure, but it's for the pleasure of Krishna. That they give pleasure to Krishna in this way. And so similarly, Kubja, her lust for Krishna, of course, is not anywhere on the level of the gopis. It is said the gopis' love for Krishna is like gold, but Kubja's love for Krishna is like iron. So a big difference between gold and iron. But still, she has love for Krishna. And by loving Krishna, by directing her lust to Krishna, she can become purified. So similarly, Satyabhama, Padmavati, they were in, they were, they, they, they lost the roads when they saw Krishna in his mm -hmm. transcendental form, so attractive. They, they, they wanted to embrace him. But, that, of course, that is their feeling for Krishna, their love for Krishna. That in itself is perfection, because their feelings are directed towards Krishna. So devotees have also feelings. We have these uh, different emotions. We cannot deny feelings which are written in the heart. But these feelings towards Krishna, that is the perfection of our consciousness. So, Lord Krishna, he sometimes gets even feelings himself. Lord Krishna feels anger to these different demons who come. Sometimes devotees may feel also lamentation. Just like Arjuna, Arjuna was fighting in the Kurukshetra war and at one point Abhimanu was killed in the battle of Kurukshetra. So one man was asking Prabhupada, he said, why did Arjuna lament? Krishna had just spoken Bhagavad Gita to him a few days earlier. Krishna had told him, there's no reason to lament for the living or for the dead. Why did Arjuna lament when Abhimanu was killed? So Prabhupada explained to the man, said yes, he said yes, Arjuna lamented for some time. But the next day he went out to fight. The next day he went into battle and he fought and he got revenge for the death of Abhimanu. So, although he lamented for some time, the next day he was there and he was on the battlefield and he was fighting and performing his duty. So he did not allow his lamentation to interfere with his service. It did not stop him from carrying out his duty. So devotees have feelings. Just like we feel the loss of devotees. When a devotee departs from the world, we feel the pain of separation. When we lose people who are very near and dear to us, we have feelings. And it's, ex it's expected that we will feel some lamentation. Lord Chaitanya was asking Ramananda Rai different questions. And he asked him, what is the most painful thing for a devotee? And Ramananda Rai replied that the most painful thing for a devotee is to lose the association of another devotee. 
said, there's nothing more painful than that. So like that, devotees, we do have feelings. We are expected to have feelings. We're not impersonal. Impersonalists, they don't have any feelings. Because, you know, it's all one. We're all one. So, the, so they don't have any emotions, any feelings. But devotees have feelings. We do have feelings. And we want to, we want to have these feelings. It, it's not wrong to have these feelings because they're in relation to Krishna and Krishna consciousness. So that is the difference. That our feelings are all in relation to Krishna and Krishna's devotees. So they are transcendental feelings. We don't want to suppress these things which can be used in the service of Krishna. Just like money. The, the famous example is that Rama Krishna, he had a picture taken with money on the table and he would say, no, I won't touch it, I won't touch it. His hands were, he said, I won't touch it. The money was on the table, he didn't want to touch it. People thought, oh, he's a great sadhu. They thought, this is a great sadhu. But Prabhupada said, they should take a picture of me counting the money. <laughs> and he said, I will spend it all for Krishna. So that is the difference. You see that the, these other people, they reject everything. They're, they, they're rejecting these things. But the devotee's renunciation is in the service of Krishna. There's Falgo Vairagya and Yukta Vairagya. So false renunciation is to reject these things which are not in relation. But Yukta Vairagya is utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. That is the proper mood of renunciation. We don't give up the world, but we use the world in the service of Krishna. And similarly, our different feelings, the lust and the envy and the lamentation, they can also be used in the service of Krishna to experience more love for the devotees and for Lord Krishna. And we can feel that mood of separation, just like when we sing that beautiful song, which is, I think, composed by Narottam Das Thakur, Yenilo Primadana Karuna. It, it's so moving, it has so much feeling to it. So, devotees have, we do have feeling. And our Krishna conscious activities are meant for elevating our emotions and our feelings and purifying them not to wipe them out. We don't want to wipe out all our feelings and our different emotions, and stuff, but we want to elevate them and bring them to the highest platform in Krishna consciousness. Being envious can also be there in Krishna consciousness. Oh, someone has done so much service for Krishna. Oh, if only I could do service like what they have done. So in that way, a devotee can be envious. Oh, I envy that devotee. They got the chance to, to be with Prabhupada and to walk with Prabhupada and to hear Prabhupada. They got the chance to serve Prabhupada. So we, we feel some envy for them. That is transcendental envy in the, with the desire to have also the association of Krishna's pure devotees. So there's nothing wrong in that. And similarly, bereavement and lamentation, when the devotee departs, it's not wrong to lament that we do feel separation. We are persons and we do have feelings. 
But these feelings are all in relation to Krishna and Krishna's devotee. So similarly, anger. We're going to hear how Dhruva Maharaj goes to fight with the Yakshas and then later on, then he will be instructed not to be so angry. <laughs> you shouldn't become overwhelmed by the anger. You become controlled and possessed by it. And actually, it, some, to some extent, it almost happened like that, that Dhruva Maharaj got so much involved in fighting with the Yakshas that he was killing the Yakshas wholesale. Thousands of them were dying. And it happened that uh, uh, Swayam Bhuvamanu had to come and instruct him that you have to stop all this killing, that this is not the behavior of a devotee. Devotees, of course, we have to be forgiving. And we should tolerate these kind of situations. Manu pointed out, your brother was killed by one yaksha, but you killed thousands of yakshas in retaliation for the death of your one brother who was killed by one yaksha, you have killed thousands of yakshas. So you have to stop. You can't go on in this way. Of course, these things happen. You get people like just like when people went to South America, when they went to South America initially, I think it was the Spanish, it was in the Portuguese, they went there, they killed everybody. They killed all the original inhabitants of that part of the world. They just killed everybody. Nobody survived. So, that's... Uh, not really what's supposed to happen. So, anger must be used, but it must be used carefully. It must be controlled. Not that we become overwhelmed and degraded by it. So, are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu? I don't know because of my ignorance. Thank you very much for your beautiful class, Transcendence of Anger. Uh, I would like to know who are, are the Yakshas and uh, the city of, um, what is mentioned? Alakapuri. What is the city? Is the Himalaya? Is China? Is Tibet? Is India? What is it? I don't know. And what do they look, the Yakshas? What yeah. do they look like? I don't know. <laughs> are they Bigfoot or the UFO or the aliens or the, what, what they look like? I don't know. Well, Prabhupada said that sometimes people say that Tibetans are the Yakshas. It said mentioned in one of the purports here that the, it said sometimes, sometimes people say that, that the Yakshas are the Tibetans. These yakshas have mystic powers, they have some magical powers, as you see when they fight with Dhruva Maharaj, they have some mystic powers. And so Tibetans, they, they are also, they have some, you know, magic powers, mystic powers. But, is there also, is, are the yakshas situated higher planets above Earth, is it? On the higher planet? Yeah, they're not exactly like us. They got more powers like that. Bubarloka. Bubarloka. Also, the uh, Kuvera is in charge of the Yakshas. <laughs> so yes. the money you have. So That's have coming up. Gold. They got gold. That's coming up in this chapter, yeah. Yes. Kuvera is the king of the Yakshas. And, and Manu will tell Dhruva Maharaj that Kuvera is not pleased because you've been killing all the yakshas. But Dhruva Maharaj, he's also not Earth planet, really. He's like Bumandala, isn't it? He's in charge of the whole thing. The whole thing, a Jumbo Dweep, right? Yes, Maharaji? Krishna Mai Maharaji has a question. Is it? Oh, thank you. 
Maharaj, we had a session one day and everybody was asked to chant 64 rounds. And what was the reaction they asked? And many of them said they felt peaceful. So my question is, is chanting 64 rounds make one more less angry, Maharaj? Yes, certainly if you chant 64 rounds, it would be good for you. Chanting, more chanting of the holy name can help you to overcome your anger. But you have to chant properly, chanting without offense. If you chant without offense, then it will help you to overcome your anger. But if you're very attached to your anger and you're not going to give up and you, you just simply think in your mind about why you're angry and who you're angry at, then that kind of chanting is not going to be so helpful. So you have to chant properly, you have to chant and hear the mantra, then it will help you to overcome your anger. Do you understand? Hare Krishna Maharaj, speaking about anger, normally when we go for Harinam and book distribution at the Chinese food courts, they'll be eating meat and you know, all. So we sell books to the Chinese, no issue, they will buy. But when you come to the table where the Indians, some of them get angry. They will tell us, why are you here? This is all people, we are eating meat and you are selling books, spiritual books. You shouldn't be here, you know? they'll be scolding. So how do we respond to them? Well, uh, you could respond to them, you could just simply leave them, go away and just go to another table. You know, that these people, some people are not very receptive and very appreciative of what we're doing. You don't want to make a big issue with it. If you try to get too much involved in arguing with them, then they will go to the manager of the store in the market and they'll get you banned and you won't be able to come there anymore and sell the books. So you have to deal with these people in a polite manner, not to upset them. So sometimes it's better just simply say, oh I'm sorry, please excuse me and go to another table. Hmm? Because if you don't, if you try to debate with them and they get more angry, then they'll get you kicked out from that place and you won't be able to go there again in some books. So you have to deal with the situation in a nice manner, try to pacify the people. Mm. So just arguing with people is not recommended. Because somebody like that, they obviously they don't want to hear. Mm? And you say something to them, they just become more angry. So better just being very humble and just, oh, I know, I'm sorry, don't mean to disturb you and go to another table. And that way, then they will, then when you're very humble and very like that, then they will feel guilty. You see? Then they'll feel that, oh, they're nice people, they're good people. But if you argue with them, then they'll, they'll hate you more. So you want to try to create a good impression and make friends with people. So we have to be very cautious how we deal with these kind of situations. Yes? Any other questions there? Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.